I want to talk about King Hezekiah. Now, this, this king, the Bible says he was a good king, and he did everything to please the Lord, okay? He was a good king. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a backdrop before I read what I want to say in, in uh, 2 Kings. Because, you know, you had David, and David had a desire to build a temple. And because all the blood that was on his hands, God said, your son's going to build it. And Solomon did build it, didn't he? And he built a beautiful temple. And it was all David's plans. Even the nails were made out of gold. <laughs> and, and you know, and, and really that was like the, the golden years of Israel at the time. It really was. But you know, it's really funny because as beautiful as that temple was, people didn't get to enjoy it very long. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Even in the lifetime of Solomon, what did he do? He started embracing other gods, right? He married other women that had other gods, and he drifted away from the Lord. And because of his sin, the nation got divided. That's what happened. But God was going to wait till Solomon was gone. And it happened, right? His son Rehoboam took over, and God ripped ten of the tribes away from King Rehoboam. And they started their own, they started their own thing. Okay. King Jeroboam did his own thing with ten tribes. And instead of a temple, he built two altars, and they were golden calves. He even set up his own priesthood <laughs> because he didn't want the people to go to Jerusalem because if they did, he would lose control. So he started his own worship, okay? So ten of those tribes never even had a chance to really enjoy the worship in the temple. <laughs> that Solomon built. It didn't get any better with the kings of Judah either. They didn't, they didn't follow God's ways the way they should either. You know? They didn't obey his commands. We heard that in the prophecy today. Actually, Glenny was quoting out of uh, Psalm 1. And in the book of Matthew. 633. And, and, um, and God cares about us following his ways and his commands. And it's easy for us to drift away. You agree? Yes. It's easy to drift. When we're not in the word of God, we could drift. When we don't follow the word of God, we could drift. So here we are, back to Hezekiah. I want to read this. This is in 2 Kings chapter 18. And I'm going to read a few verses. Now when Hezekiah showed up, it was about 230 years after Solomon. It's a long time. 230 years. You know how old our nation is? I was thinking about it today. We're almost 250 years. Now, we've drifted away pretty far as a nation compared to when this nation first formed. Didn't we? When the Christians wanted to come here, 
to, free, uh, to have freedom of worship from England, and they came to this country. That was about 250 years ago. It's actually 248, if you think about it. 1776, right? So here, here's Hezekiah, about 230, 230 years later, okay, after Solomon died. Let's think about this. Verse 1. It came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel. Now that's the ten tribe king, okay? And Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, and the daughter of Zechariah. And he did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places. He broke down the sacred pillars. He cut down the asterisk. And he broke down in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses made. For until those days, the son of Israel burned incense to it. Isn't it funny how we make idols? Out of things that, yeah, the brazen serpent, they made an idol out of it. And it was called Neshaton. He trusted in the Lord the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him. He kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, I, I want to just point something out in the first verse. It says that he came about in the third year of Hosea. Hosea, okay? Now, that's the last king of the ten tribes before they went into captivity. And so, when Hezekiah became king, and, and Hosea was not a good king, and he did a lot of wicked things. It was really bad. Israel was in such decline and apostasy, okay, there was no turning back. And you know, God, you know, God, he pleaded with them a lot of times with the prophets of God. It's not like he didn't say, hey, come back, come back, come back. He did that a lot of times with them. But they were at a place of no return. And when Hezekiah came on the scene, it says it was the third year of Hosea. And Hosea, he was a king for... Nine years. So he got to see the last king before the last king got conquered by the Assyrians. He got to see, you know, he got to see, he lived through the last years in the decline and the fall of Israel. He saw it. He saw it before they fell. He saw the last king and he saw when they all got destroyed and got taken in captivity. Hezekiah saw that. Not only that, when he took over as king, that his father, okay, his father was doing evil too. And this was Judah. To a point, he even closed the doors to the sanctuary. People weren't even going in the sanctuary to worship anymore. When Hezekiah took over. Now that's how far gone. So not only was Israel in bad place, Judah was too. So when Hezekiah came on the scene, okay, he took a stand. And he says, you know what? I want to put God first. Now that I'm king, I want to put God first. Now I want to look at 2 Chronicles for a minute. Chapter 28 for a second. Now 
No, actually, 29. I'm sorry. And look what happened. Now, you've got to remember, his father did evil, too. So it wasn't just Hosea. It was his dad, too. And the temple that Solomon built, the doors were locked. <laughs> okay? That's where they were at. A lot happened in 230 years. What do you think? You know, it's compromise. And compromise will happen when we drift from the Word of God. And, and over here, it tells us in uh, verse, chapter 29, this is Second Chronicles 29. I want to start with verse 1. Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all his father David had done. In the first year of his reign, so you hear these politicians say, on day one, okay, the first year of his reign, look what he did. In the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and he repaired them. He brought the priests and the Levites and gathered them on the square of the east. And, and he, he brought the people back to where they should be in their worship. And it even talks about all the idols and all the things that he destroyed, okay? <laughs> He, got, he, he really clean house, this king. And he got rid of all these ungodly things. King Hezekiah was a great guy. And he had, he had a heart for God. He wasn't going to follow the lead of his father. See, his father was not doing those things. But he didn't let his father's example he didn't follow his father's footsteps. He went back to God. That's pretty powerful right there. Now, so he had a revival. That's a revival right there. An awakening. How many of us know our country needs an awakening? God help us, right? Right? When you have one leader of one party, okay, having an abortion clinic outside where they're running for president, giving free abortions to anybody who wants to come. God help us. In the Old Testament, you know what that God is called? The God of Malek. Do you know that we still worship Malek today? We also worship Ashtaroth, too. It just comes in a different form. But I ain't going to talk about those things today. Because that will put me off track. Because I want to talk about how Hezekiah, okay? Hezekiah, he put it in his heart that he was going to make things right again with God. He was a good king. And, and he didn't... Because he saw the decline. And you know what? The decline has consequences. The decline of a nation has consequences on all the people. Because God can't bless us if we're in sin. You know what I mean? But Hezekiah, he, he wanted God's favor and his love. I mean, and his, he wanted to follow God. So now I want to go to 2 Chronicles. After he got rid of all these idols, and he got his own house in order, okay? See, because we don't only need to get the world straightened out. Sin has come into church, too. And sometimes we need to get our own house in order, too. 
Sometimes we can dumb down God's grace, can we? Oh, I'm saved by grace. God understands. It doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter. Well, guess what? We've got to clean our house. It does matter. Thinking like that, we're saying it doesn't matter what God thinks. We've got to follow God's ways. And Hezekiah did that with his people. He opened up the temple doors again. Okay? But not only that. Again, he saw the ten tribes, the last king, and he also saw the last king get defeated. And they all went in exile. On year three, they all went on exile. And the ten tribes no longer existed. There was no more calf worship anymore. It was over. God said, I had enough. And that's the way it is. But Hezekiah, I love this because he had a heart. He had a heart for people that, that were in a bad place. And he extended a loving hand to them. You know, he extended a loving hand to the people of Israel after they were defeated, okay? And, and, and I want to look at this. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 1. Hezekiah sent all Israel and Judah, see, all, all Israel and Judah. So, in other words, all 12 tribes got this invitation. Now you've got to remember, they were divided. <laughs> Politically, they were divided, okay? He wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. So he not only extended the people in Judah where Jerusalem is, but he, all the people, even the ones that are in exile now, okay, he extended an invitation to them. You know, and, and I think about that, okay? Now, how would you feel? You know, God cares about these people that are out there lost, don't he? Lost, and they don't know their left hand from their right, and those people from Israel, 230 years, okay? They haven't even been to the temple in Jerusalem. They haven't worshipped in the temple of Jerusalem. And Hezekiah, it bothered him that they were so lost and they didn't see the value of it all and they were doing their own thing. Now that they, now that they, they were in the woodshed, you know? Now that they were in a woodshed and God put them in a woodshed, Hezekiah reached out to them. Praise God for that. Do you know how Jesus came to seek and to save who is lost? I'm so glad that he reaches out to those that are lost. And, you know, and, and that's his heartbeat. And I think that's one reason why Hezekiah was uh, commended for doing things right in the eyes of the Lord. He was actually taking on the heart of Jesus. <laughs> he was reaching out to these people for 230 years were doing the wrong thing. Worshipping the wrong things. Not even caring anything about the God of Israel. They were worshipping calves, right? And they even got punished for that. But he extended an invitation to them. To celebrate the Passover. What's the Passover represent for us? Jesus dying on the cross, redeeming us of our sins, right? Even in the Old Testament, you get to see the heart of God here. 
how God, you know, God commanded his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God for that. You imagine how these people might have felt? They probably didn't know right from wrong, or if they did know right from wrong, maybe they felt in their minds, okay, that there was no hope for them. You know, I've done enough bad things in my life. I've drifted away from God so far. How can he ever love me? And, you know, and then our pride gets in the way. You know what I mean? Don't our pride get in the way sometimes? If we fail God and, and uh, we go down the wrong path, and we can, the devil can get us to think, okay, that there's no hope for us, you know? But Hezekiah cared about those people. He cared about them. And he says, you know, I got the temple all straightened out, and uh, we're, we're back on track with God. We got rid of those things that we should get rid of in our life. And, and I want to extend a hand to my brother. You know, I want to extend a hand. And that's what he did. I want to go, go down to verse 4. This thing was right in the sight of the king and all the assembly. So they established a decree to circulate a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan that they should come and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel, at Jerusalem. And they had not celebrated in great numbers as it was prescribed. Now, a little bit later, I'm going to show a verse. It says, they haven't celebrated the Passover since Solomon. That's 230 years. That's a long time. Did they drift? Absolutely. Some of it wasn't their fault, though. The leaders were leading them down the wrong path, right? But I'm going to keep going. Verse 6, the couriers sent through all Israel, Judah, and the letters from the hand of the king of princes, even according to the command of the king, saying, O sons of Israel, this is what the, this is what the letter said, O sons of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Isaac and Israel, that he may return to those of you who escaped and are left in the hand of the kings of Assyria. Don't be like your fathers and your brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord your God, their fathers, so that he made them a horror as you see. Now, do not stiffen your neck like your fathers, but yield to the Lord and enter his sanctuary he has consecrated forever and serve the Lord your God. Do you know that God is always pleading For everybody. Even now. Think of the worst sinner you could imagine right now. The person who's so far from God and they don't even care anything about God and maybe all their philosophy and their ideology and all those things that they have, okay? God cares about that person. It's always God's heart to save. It's always God's heart to save those that are so far gone, you know. And we see it here. And they're being told, don't be like your fathers. Look what your fathers did. They disobeyed and look, they're being punished. But there's hope. There's hope. And that hope comes through repentance. That's what it is. Come back. Come back to the sanctuary. Come back. And, and I want to look at verse 9. And really, you can almost see 2 Chronicles 7.14 over here. If my people, which I call by my name, shall turn from their wicked ways. 
See, turn from their wicked ways. Right? I will heal their land. See, it's always God's will to do that, isn't it? And you're going to see it over here. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your sons, and find compassion. See, before those who led them captive and returned to this land, for the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate and will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. That's all that God's asking for, is repentance. There's no sin that God can't forgive. There's no lifestyle that God can't change. You know what I mean? And I know I'm living proof of that. Hmm, glory to God. As I know at one time, at one time, I didn't think God could save me. But he's compassionate. And he's gracious. He's just looking for repentance. That's what he's looking for. Even these people that drifted away 230 years before, he even cares about them. Yeah. And he cares about our neighbor. You know, he cares about our neighbor. He cares about our co-worker. He, he cares about our president. He cares about all these people, right? He cares about the transvestite. He cares about the lesbian. He cares about the preacher that's preaching heresy. He cares about the church that's following heresy. He loves all these people. He's just looking for repentance. That's what he's looking for. And you know what? That's how we get revival. And and I believe that our, our nation is not so far gone that we can't see a revival. That all the things that we see all around us, right? God can turn that around. It just takes repentance to do that. Right? But I want to look at verse 10 and verse 11. Because, see, the invitation went out to these ten tribes, you know? All ten tribes. But not all ten responded in a good way. Now, I I don't know, and and, and I'm thinking about, you know, this event we're doing, about ready to do, this drama we're going to do, right? And and I I just, well, we had over a thousand tickets. I'm down to about a hundred. So somebody's been helping me pass them out. Praise God for that. Those are all invitations for souls. And God cares about these people. He does. Don't he? And and last week, I went out giving tickets. And there was one day I was high as a kite. And the other day, I was like defeated because I got so much rejection and mockery giving out those tickets. See, I got different reactions. I did. Just like over here. Look at verse 10. So the couriers passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. See? Not everybody's going to receive that invitation. Or they're not going to receive it with the right heart. Right? Right? Matter of fact, I got mocked so bad one day passing out the tickets, I decided I'm going to go home. I had enough, re- I, I had enough rejection today. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just saying. 
It happened to me. And guess what? <clears throat> I'd like to say it w didn't affect me, but it did. I had to go home and lick my wounds a little bit. But that's okay. I'm doing it for Jesus. But they laughed him to scorn and they mocked them. But if you look at verse 11, it says, nevertheless, some men, some men. See, it's not up to us to decide who says yes and who says no. He tells us to go. Don't he? But some men, Asher, Manasseh, Zebulun, humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And you know what? I know for a fact, and I gave quite a few tickets out, and I plan on giving out more this week. I do. I know that not all people that get an invitation is going to say no, and they're not going to mock me. And if one soul comes to Christ, it was worth it all. It doesn't matter, right? So what if my feelings get hurt? <laughs> yeah, I saw Aunt Jessie out in the grocery store passing them out. <laughs> Glory to God. And you got a lot of rejection, too. I saw it. But not everybody rejected you. When I was watching, anyway. You know, some people took the ticket because, oh, that's a nice little old lady there. I guess I'll take it from her. <laughs> Don't know if it went in the garbage after that or not. Doesn't, you know. But you know what? Even if it goes in the garbage. Don't you think that God can't, can use that? Nobody else was here. Yeah. And, and you know, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a, a moment, me giving out tickets. The day I was high as a kite. I, I'm going around, and there's this guy, and he was a really sketchy-looking guy, okay? And I was like, whoa, my flesh, you didn't want to go see him, you know? And it was like, I don't know if I'm going to go over there. I think I'm going to just check it out. That's kind of what I was thinking. Then I prayed, and the Holy Spirit says, I have given you boldness. <laughs> so I went over, and I gave that guy a ticket. And you know what that guy did? He cried right there. He's a backslidden Christian. Living in his car because of the drugs and the life he's living. He just got thrown out of his house two days prior to that. He was living in his car. And right before I showed up, he was wondering if life was even worth living. And when I showed up, you know what happened? God sent me a sign today. And that sign is you. Can I have more tickets than this? I got some friends I want to bring. Whew. Isn't that powerful? And you know what? It makes getting mocked and being scorned worth it all. If God's going to restore a backslidden, he goes, yeah, and I've been thinking, Living in my car, this is what he told me. And it's really funny because he saw the ticket, okay? He saw what it said. Heaven's gates and hell's flames. I was just thinking about this this morning. If I was to die and face judgment, where would I be? That person's heart is right where it needs to be. See how the Holy Spirit works? And I'm really looking forward to this guy coming. He said he's going to come. He's going to take a couple friends. 
And I'll tell you, that guy didn't smell very good. Well, that's okay. It's a soul. And it doesn't matter how far gone we can go, you know? God's love is always there. And he wants to save. See, that's God's, that's been his plan since the beginning. He came so that he could save the lost. Even in the Old Testament, we see this with Hezekiah. And some of them went. And if you keep, go, if you keep reading in this story, you know, some of it went. You know, verse 18, it says, The multitude of the people, many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, had not purified themselves and pers- then prescribed. For Hezekiah prayed for them that may the good Lord pardon them. <laughs> that's, why, that's why Hezekiah prayed. See, they didn't feel worthy to do the Passover. Hezekiah prayed that God would pardon them. And look at it, verse 19. Everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary. And look what God did with these people. The Lord heard Hezekiah, and he healed the people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, being restored in right relationship with Jesus is the greatest healing we could ever have. I hope the rest of those tickets can go. I hope you can help me pass them out. This is the last push to do this, okay? Because next week, this place is going to transform into judgment. A place of judgment with the angel of the book of life. And God's heart is to save. God's heart's to save. And for three nights, that drama is going to go on. And it's not a different drama every night. It's the same drama every night. Night after night, it'll be the same drama. So if you're coming here just so you can get blessed, it's not for you. It's for the lost. Let's fill these seats with the lost because Jesus loves the lost. And it's going to be three times he's going to plead with these people about his love. Three times. It doesn't matter what people have done. Like that homeless guy. That backslidden homeless guy. And he told me he was heading for ministry before he fell. Living in a car. A prodigal son. Eating pig's food. When he could be in the father's house. Eating pig's food. And I even told him that. I says, you know what? You don't need to eat pig's food anymore. The father wants you back. And he started crying again. And we prayed. And I was so blessed by meeting this guy. It encouraged me. I'm ready for more rejection. If I get one more person that says, yeah, I'll go. And you know what? I heard a lot of people say, yeah, I'll go. I got good reception sometimes, and sometimes I didn't. Maybe some of you have the same story. But those tickets aren't going to do any good if you don't use them. Right? Right? Invite your friend. You get an opportunity right now to invite your friend.
to be saved. And, and the Lord, you know, and I was thinking about this at 3 o'clock in the morning. A year ago, with the world falling apart and knowing, okay, the rapture can happen any day. Any day. You know, God doesn't care that I get entertained in church. The most the thing he's going to ask us for, what did you do with the Great Commission? Right, right. Yeah, you know, it has nothing to do with a great band or a great worship service or uh, having the frills that church. You know, church is all about that now, right? But we don't hear much people talking about preaching the gospel. And Jesus is coming back. And the rapture is about ready to happen. It could happen today. There's nothing stopping the rapture from happening. It could happen today. But before the rapture happens, Jesus tells us to occupy till he comes. It's our job to give the gospel because that's the heart of God. It's his desire for all to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes, whosoever It doesn't matter. He's looking for someone to believe. And it's going to be a day. It's going to be a day. It's going to be too late. And a year ago, a year ago, I was feeling, reading my Bible, and I read my Bible a lot, as you guys know. And a lot of scriptures are telling me, you know, it's looking like the rise of the Antichrist is going to happen very soon. Because it's not just America that's crazy. The whole world is crazy. And they're all thinking the same way. It won't be long. We're not going to have much more time. And the God put on my heart, extend, extend an invitation to the people in your town to see if they get saved. I really feel this is a God thing. And we're giving them an opportunity to get saved. They say, no, that's not on us. But if they say yes, you know, because Jesus is in a saving business, right? You know, I, I, I want to read this before we have communion, because we're going to have communion. What does the Passover represent? Deliverance? Deliverance for bondage, right? And God powerfully delivered the people of Israel, didn't he? And Jesus powerfully delivered us on the cross. And he rose from the grave to prove he had the power to do that. Luke chapter 15, you know, and I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, but there's three stories in here. I call this the lost and found department. 
you got the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. And the whole chapter is talking about people who are lost. See, the lost sheep, guess what? That sheep belonged to the fold at one time. God cares about them. And I found one when I had that ticket in my hand. That homeless guy. That was the one. And, and you know, I, I just want to say what Jesus had to say at the end of these parables. Verse 7. I tell you in the same way, this is about the lost sheep. I tell you the same way. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. That's how much God cares about that. The lost coin. There were 10 coins. There was one missing, right? Verse 10. In the same way, I tell you, there's joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Man. You know, if this whole thing leads to one person getting saved, the angels are rejoicing. You know, it's worth it. And then the prodigal son. And we know the story, the brother complained and all that, right? But look at what happened in verse 32. But we, he's telling the brother this, but we had to be merry and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. That's the heart of God. And I think that's why Hezekiah did things right before the Lord because he took on the heart of Jesus by reaching out to his brothers that were in apostasy. And God is looking for us to do that. You know, and, and uh, I want to have communion now. And the reason why I, I chose to do communion, it's not communion Sunday. But you know what? It's kind of good to remind ourselves what does the cross mean for us? You know, you know let, let's think about where we were once and where we are now. You know, and, and when we have communion, not only think about where we were, and my question would be, as you're having communion, what does Jesus mean to you? And I would also like us to think when we're having communion, wouldn't it be great if others that are restored can also rejoice at communion? See, it's not, we're not on a retirement plan waiting for, you know, right? Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if that homeless guy, if he gives his heart to Christ and truly repents and, and makes things right with the Lord, wouldn't it be great to have communion with him next month? And for him to have that gratitude that we have, when we have communion. See, it's not for us to just keep to ourselves. It's to be shared. Right? Amen to that. 
And I want to do communion. Father, I just want to thank you today. I want to thank you for our salvation. I want to thank you for your grace. And Father, in my prayer right now, Father, I'm praying that we're going to have other people at the table with us that never had communion with the right heart. And uh, Father, I pray that you bring healing to them. Just like that's what happened with Hezekiah, Father. Some of these people were healed. And I pray that you bring healing for their souls. And God, I'm, I thank you for the cross. I thank you that you seek to save which is lost. I thank you that's your heart. And help us, Father, to follow and fulfill the great commission while we have time, oh God. And God, I pray that everything will go the way you want it to go. And I'm believing you for souls. I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, in the middle of the night,